In this video, we're going to talk about what we call rational expressions and rational functions. A rational expression is an expression that involves the division of two polynomials. I have an example right here. x plus 2 all over 3x squared minus 7x plus 14. As you can see, x plus 2 is a polynomial as well as 3x squared minus 7x plus 14. And so basically what we're introducing here is fractions with variables in them. All right. Um, what we want to do first is we want to uh, learn how to evaluate rational expressions. And the reason why we call these are ra these rational expressions again is because remember a rational number is a number that can be written as a fraction. And so if we have variables in there, we're going to ha actually have an algebraic expression. And so we're going to call these rational expressions. All right. Evaluating is the same as before, just like with linear uh, equations or linear expressions. We can evaluate a rational expression by substituting the value in for the variable. So if we look at this example here, I have x squared minus 3x minus 28, excuse me, all over x squared minus 15x plus 56. I want to evaluate that rational expression for x equals negative 2. All that means is that I'm going to go to that everywhere I see an x, and I'm going to substitute negative 2 for that. Okay, so I'm going to have a negative 2 squared minus 3 times negative 2 minus 28 all over negative 2 squared again. Notice that I'm putting that negative 2 in parentheses so I don't get confused with subtraction. Okay, and the rest is just simplifying. So substitute the value and simplify. Remember your, your rules for your signs and order of operations and all of that. And I don't know where I got that 15 from, but that is definitely a 56. And then the rest is just simplifying even further. Um, we're going to end up with a negative 18 over 90. As always, in every time in this class when I ask you something, I always want you to leave your answer in simplest form. We can simplify by dividing the common factor 18. And so I'll be left with a negative 1 fifth. 18 goes both into negative 18 and 90. And we get negative one-fifth okay so that's evaluating uh, rational expressions all right there's a, a unique property that's introduced uh, I guess I can't I wouldn't necessarily say property but something unique happens when we introduce variables into a fraction um, there's always one thing that I was always told growing up when we were dealing with math is that we can never divide by zero all right, when we divide by zero, we get something that is undefined. And so with these rational expressions, there are certain x values that if, hey, if I try to evaluate it, I'm going to get zero in the denominator, and it's going to mean that this rational expression is going to be undefined. And that can't happen. We don't want that to ever happen. And so I'm going to ask you, all right, determine or find the values for which each expression is undefined when I'm talking about these rational expressions. When I say that, I'll ask you to go through these steps right here. Set the denominator equal to zero and then solve for x. Because those x values that make the denominator zero is going to cause that rational expression to be undefined. Okay, and So we're going to look at a couple examples where we actually find those x values. Let's look at this first example here. Um, 3 over 2x minus 7. All right, I want to know where it's undefined. This rational expression is undefined. Key thing here is to worry only about the denominator. The numerator has nothing to do with anything being undefined. Right? I can't divide by 0 by looking at my numerator. I have to look at my denominator. So I'm going to set 2x minus 7 equal to 0, and I'm going to solve for x. So I get 2x. If I add 7 to both sides, I get 2x equals 7. And if I divide both sides by 2, I get 7 halves. x equals 7 halves. This is the x value, or the value, that causes my denominator to be 0. All right. So if I were to plug this 7 halves in for x here, I'm going to end up getting 0 in my denominator, and it'd be undefined. All right. And so that's why we go through this process here. 
Let's look at this second example. x squared plus 5x plus 11 all over x squared plus 7x minus 30. Again, the only thing that matters to me when I'm asking where, where I'm trying to find where the denominator is 0, i.e. where this rational expression is undefined, I'm only going to look at the denominator. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to set it equal to 0. And I'm going to solve for x. Okay. And so this is a quadratic that does not have a greatest common factor, GCF. And so I'm going to factor it to a binomial, to two binomials being multiplied by each other. The two binomials are going to be x plus 10 and x minus 3. Okay, so I have two things that multiply together to give me 0. I'm going to set both of those equal to 0. And then I'm going to solve for x. If I subtract 10 from both sides, I get x equals negative 10. And if I add 3 to both sides, I'll get x equals 3. So these are my two x values that make my denominator 0, therefore making my rational expression undefined. Because again, I can't divide by 0. Let's move on to something else. All right. Since we have fractions here with these rational expressions, we want to be able to uh, simplify those things. And it's going to be very similar to how you simplify just regular old fractions. All right. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it back to when you first learn how to simplify fractions. For instance, I have this fraction 12 over 15 here. Now, when we when I first teach people how to simplify fraction fractions, we go through a process called prime factorization, which means to rewrite my numerator, which is 12, and my denominator in this example, which is 15, rewriting those as a product of prime numbers. For instance, 12 is the same thing as 2 times 2 times 3, right? 4 times 3, right, is 12. And 15 is the same thing as 3 times 5, okay? And so I've rewritten 12 as prime numbers, remember 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, those are our prime numbers, as a product of prime numbers. And once I do this, I can cancel the common factors. 3 is in common in both my numerator and my denominator. And so if I want to know how this fraction simplifies, well, all I have to do is 2 times 2, which is 4, and 5 in the denominator, okay? So this is the real process that we go through, you know, as we learn more and more math, we get a little fancy and say, oh, well, we look at 12 and 15 and we automatically know that their greatest common factor is 3. And so we can divide the 12 by 3 and get this 4 here. We can divide the 5 by 3 and get uh, the 15 by 3 and we get the 5, right? But this is the real mathematics behind why all this stuff works. Prime factorization, all right? And so I'm going to do the exact same thing when I have these rational expressions. Remember, when we have these expressions here, they're going to have variables in them. All right. And so we can't go through a prime factorization exactly like we would with with numbers, but we can factor, you know, just find just factor the numerator and the denominator and then we'll cancel those common factors. So those are the two steps that I'm going to take to simplify rational expressions. Again, if you want to write it down, we're going to factor the numerator and the denominator, and then we're going to cancel the common factors. All right, let's look at a couple of examples. In part A, I have x squared minus x minus 30 all over x squared plus 8x plus 15. I want to simplify. Those are my only instructions. All right, and that's something that I'm going to do all the time. All right, <clears throat> well, I'm going to go to my numerator. All right, there's no GCF in this quadratic, three terms, one in front of the x squared. So it's a nice and easy one to factor. Two numbers that multiply to give you a negative 30 add up to a negative 1, negative 6, and positive 5. Go to the denominator. Let's factor that. All right, again, it's very similar. Two numbers that multiply to give you 15 add up to 8. Excuse the inking here. Um, 5 and positive 3, they work. All right. Now that we factor completely, see if there's any factors that are in common on the numerator and the denominator. Well, the x plus 5 is in common and the x plus 3 is in common. All right. Make sure you are aware that when we when we simplify, just like in this case up here, there's only multiplication between all of these factors. That's why we use factor, right? It's multiplication. All right. I can never immediately say, "Oh, this 
cancel these x squareds here. No, I can't do that because there's an addition and subtraction between those. So don't let that be a mistake that you end up making. All right, let's go to our next example. x squared minus 15x plus 56 all over 64 minus x squared. Again, in order for us to simplify this, we need to factor so that we can see that multiplication. We can't just cancel those x squareds. All right, so... These are some nice, one to fat, nice ones to factor. They're not always going to be this simple, but you already know how to factor. So I just want to go through a couple of examples. Two numbers that multiply to give me 56 add up to negative 15. Well, minus 8, minus 7. Those two will work. And in my denominator, there's no GCF. I have two terms. I see a square, so I have a difference of squares. We got to be careful here. The numbers first and our variable second. So when we factor into our difference of squares, we're going to have an 8 minus x times an 8 plus x. All right. Make sure the 8 is first and the x is second because that's going to make a difference, especially in the subtraction here. Now, if you look at this example, it looks like we can kind of cancel this term with this term, but they're not exactly the same, right? If you think about it, let's, for instance, I'm just going to, I'm just pulling this out of the blue. 3 minus 2 is not exactly the same as 2 minus 3, all right? 3 minus 2 is 1, and 2 minus 3 is negative 1, all right? When we have things like this, we call them opposites. They only differ by the negative sign, all right? They're opposites. They're the same number in absolute value, but one's positive, one's negative. And so when we simplify these, let's just, let's, just, let's just look at it, right? I'm going to take this x minus 8, okay? And I'm going to multiply it by negative 1, right? Since these are opposites, I should end up with this 8 minus x. Let's see if that happens. Well, if I multiply that by negative 1... Distribute the, x, the negative. I get negative x plus 8. Now, I always talk about the order mattering here, right? But if you think about it, as long as your signs are the same, you can switch the order, right? As long as you keep the sign the same. So since this 8 is positive, if I want to write that first, I'm going to have to write 8. This negative x is, this x is negative. If I want to write it second, I have to write it as a minus x. And notice we get this thing that we have here, all right? So they differ only by negative. If you multiply one by negative, you get the other. And so instead of simplifying this, just crossing them out, <clears throat> what I do is I rewrite one of them as the negative of switching the order. So instead of this being an eight minus X, I'm gonna write it as a negative X, excuse me, x minus 8. And now that I have these being the same, now I can cancel them. But I got to remember that I'm going to have a negative. All right. Now, it's going to stay negative. But in all actuality, when I have a fraction and I have a negative in my fraction, I can always bring my negative out to the front. And so this is going to simplify to a negative. I'm just bringing it out front. And now I have my fraction x minus 7 over 8 plus x, all right? Now, these opposites only occur when we have subtraction, right? Got to have subtraction. Addition, the order does not matter here, right? So, for instance, if I did a 3 plus 2, well, that equals 5. If I do a 2 plus 3, that also equals 5. So, I don't have to worry about switching my order or anything with addition, only for subtraction. That's when they're going to have opposites. All right. Sometimes this is a very hard to get, wrap your head around, but as more the more practice you get, the more the better you'll be. All right. So that's rational expressions. That's the first part of what we wanted to talk about. The second part of what we want to talk about is what we call rational functions. All right. This introduces another variable. Okay. So <clears throat> the definition, the technical definition, the mathematical definition of a rational function. Um, they are functions of the form r of x equals f of x over g of x. Now, normally we say f of x, but since I use f of x over here, right, I'm calling it r of x for rational function, all right? Where f of x and g of x are polynomials and g of x does not equal zero. 
And we just say that g of x does not equal zero so that we won't have an undefined um, rational function, all right? Remember, this just means y value, all right? When we have a function, just to, to just to review, I know we reviewed this before, but a function is a relation. You can think of a set of ordered pairs or a mathematical statement, um, equation, um, where each input, where each or which, <laughs> where each input, has exactly one output. And this is a very, very important thing in mathematics, right? Because if we put something into something that we're, you know, if we put something in a problem, we want just one solution to come out, right? And so we always like to study these things called functions so that we can ensure that we're going to have exactly one output, okay? And so it introduces our y value, which is also our output here. So x is our input, y is our output, and that's why we study these things, all right? This is different from an expression. I'm going to scroll back up to where we first started looking at rational expressions, all right? Rational expressions are just, just a plain old expression, all right? Just a plain, plain old algebraic looking thing, right? With variables and numbers and, and arithmetic, uh, arithmetic op operations, right? When we introduce an output, okay, that's when it becomes a function, and especially it becomes a function when we know that each input has exactly one output. All right, so what we're going to do is work with these things in the same way that we were working with rational expressions. All right, some of the same things we can do with rational expressions, we can do with rational functions, rational functions, because rational functions basically come from rational expressions. I know it's a little weird, but yeah, they basically come from each other. All right. For instance, in this example, we have this rational function. It says to find r of 1. Notice this 1 is in the same place where the x was in my functional statement. And so this just means to evaluate at x equals 1. All right. This is just function notation for the word evaluate. And so if we do that, R of 1 is going to equal, well, hey, I'm going to put the 1 in for x. And then simplify. Okay. I get 1 plus 8 minus 20 all over 2 minus 3 minus 15. And I made a mistake there. 7 times the 1 is definitely 7, okay? All right, and so if I simplify that, I get a negative 12 over a negative 16. A negative divided by negative is a positive. And just like we would simplify before, if I look at 12 and 16, they have a common factor of 4. So I'm going to end up with 3 fourths, okay? So R of 1 equals 3 fourths. This is the functional notation for evaluate, all right? All right, next thing we wanna talk about is what we call the domain of rational functions. Remember, your domain is your set of all x values, your inputs, where the function is defined. All right, and so this is gonna be pretty important. All right, where your function is defined. Now, I told you that rational functions, they kind of come from those rational expressions. And we've talked about rational expressions. Um, we've talked about how there are some x values that make those rational expressions undefined. Well, the domain is where the rational function, you can think of rational expression, is defined. All right. So since we already know a little bit about where the rational function is undefined, we're going to use that same kind of technique to help us find a domain, all right? In some cases, and actually in most cases, it's easier to find where a function is undefined rather than finding where a function is defined, right? 
Um, most functions have a domain of all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. It's only at certain x values where certain functions are undefined. And so when we find a domain of rational functions, right, we're going to look for where it's undefined. And it's going to be all real numbers except that those x values that make it undefined, right? So just like we would do when we had the rational expressions, we're going to set the denominator equal to zero. We're going to solve for x. But once we're finished solving for x, our domain is going to be all real numbers except, except those x values that we have found in the second step there. So we got two examples of that. All right. R of x equals x squared minus 3x minus 21 all over 2x squared plus 9x minus 5. Again, domain only references the denominator, right? That's where stuff becomes undefined when we divide by 0. So I'm going to take that denominator, 2x squared plus 9x minus 5, set it equal to 0, and I'm going to solve for x, all right? This is a quadratic equation. There's no GCF. There's a one in front, a two in front of that x squared. So I'm going to do my end up factoring by grouping. Multiply the two and the negative five, we get negative ten. Find two numbers that multiply to give you negative ten. Add up to a positive nine. Ten and negative one definitely work. So I'm going to rewrite that nine x as ten x minus x. And now I have four terms, and I can factor by grouping. Out of the first two terms, I can factor out a 2x. I'll be left with an x plus 5. And out of my second grouping, I can factor out a negative 1, and I'll be left with x plus 5 as well. Now, when I get to this point, of course, nice things happen. Happens, right? Or nice things happen. Right? They both have an x plus 5. I, I factor out that, and I'll be left with a 2x in the first one. I'll be left with a minus 1, right, in my second term. I have two things that multiply together to give me zero. Let's set them both equal to zero. And let's solve for x. Subtracting five, I get x equals negative five. My ink is messing up on me. And if I add one to both sides, I'll get two x equals one. <clears throat> two x equals one. And x equals one half. And so my domain, when I write it out, right, so I'm done there. Those are the x values where my function is undefined. So my domain is going to be all real numbers except negative five and a half. That is my domain. This is how we leave our final answer. When we're talking about domain, all right? At least in this section here. Let's look at another example. 1 over x squared minus 9. Again, we want to find a domain. And again, the only thing that matters is that denominator there, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that denominator. I'm going to set it equal to 0. And I'm going to solve for x. This is a difference of squares. I can factor that into x plus 3 times x minus 3. I have two things that multiply to give me zero. Let's set them both equal to zero. X plus three equals zero. X minus three equals zero, All right? If I subtract three from both sides, I'll get X equals negative three. If I add three to both sides here, I get X equals positive three. So when I write my domain, again, it's gonna be all real numbers, except negative three, and three. This concludes our lesson on rational and on the introduction to rational expressions and rational functions.